And we are live. Welcome to another edition of DT Live. Tonight's live stream is going to be another Q&A session where I interact with you guys in the YouTube chat. Uh, you guys leave your questions and comments. Of course, we usually have a pretty big crowd here, so obviously I won't be able to answer everything that gets posted, but I'll try. Those of you that leave super chats, though, I'll be sure to, to catch all of your comments and questions. Those of you that are already here, we've got 81 people here at the start of the stream, uh, give me a yay or a nay on the audio levels because I'm not monitoring the stream audio, so I do like to confirm that you guys are actually able to hear before we get started, just because, you know, pulse audio. Let me get a sip of my beverage. And I know somebody will ask, this is Flying Tiger. The Flying Tiger Burma Blonde from the Flying Tiger Brewery in Monroe, Louisiana. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Audio is good. I got you. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Now, I was going to go back. I, I know some of you guys have been here for a couple of hours in the chat and left your questions, but there was so much chat that I actually, there, there's a limit to how far back in the YouTube chat I can go. So really, anybody that posted anything older than probably 15, 20 minutes, your question has already been lost, so I can't go back and answer it. I did have one question posted over on Patreon from a patron. Uh, she asked me about Gentoo and my Gentoo installation video that I did from a couple of years back. And she was asking if that video is still relevant, like if she installed Gentoo and followed along with my video, would she be able to get Gentoo installed by following that video? Well, chances are that 95% of everything I did in that video is still relevant. There's going to be changes probably to the installation process, minor changes. I mean, that's with... Everything, though, that's like why I have to make an Arch Linux install video like every year. I've made two or three of them, you know, like every year, year and a half, I'll make a new Arch install video. But for the most part, the changes are minor. And it's not like I want you guys to go watch my video and follow along step by step. And, you know, you can do this in a VM, which is what I recommend you guys do. But if you're doing this on your physical machine, I hope you've actually practiced in a virtual machine a few times before just wiping out your main production machine and trying to install a distribution you really don't know anything about. So I am monitoring the, uh, the YouTube stream here, and it looks like there is some buffering. Are you guys experiencing buffering? It is storming here. That's the reason I ask. Right now, it looks like I don't have any networking issues. At least OBS is telling me that the network is fine. But it looks like on YouTube's end, I was previewing the stream for a second, the video. And it looked like it was buffering a bit. There's some pretty serious thunderstorms outside here today. But as far as, yeah, the Gen 2 installation videos and the Arch installation videos, yeah, you can go watch them. Yeah, minor things will have changed. I'd never go and watch any of those kinds of videos from anybody and think, that you can follow it step by step, a line by line, and get something installed. They're mainly to show you guys that it's not hard, right? When I do an Arch installation or Gen 2 installation or whatever it happens to be, uh, NixOS and Geeks, it's mainly to show you guys that these distributions aren't difficult to install, that even I, somebody like me, I can go follow the documentation and, you know, copy and paste things into a command line and get these things installed. And I want you guys to see that you could probably do that too. It's mainly to show you the process, uh, the process of going and reading a wiki. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to show more than you guys actually go follow me line by line and boom, you got Gen 2 installed. Uh, Josh, left me a super chat here. Uh, thank you, Josh. He says, tell Big Pod to drink some coffee, and he's not a real developer. Yeah, okay, if we see Big Pod in here tonight, I'll let him, let him know, Josh. But I, I think you'll probably see him before me anyway. I'm sure you'll catch up with him. All right. Yeah, it's a bit laggy. It is buffering. Yeah, that's what I was afraid. Well, hopefully it doesn't get too bad right now. It looks like it's okay. If it gets too bad, though, you know, we may just have to shut it down. 
when I had originally planned this stream a few hours ago. I didn't know who it was going to be, you know, a tornado outside right now, it's essentially. <laughs> uh, also, if you hear some loud thunder, you know. All right, so buffering is bloat, says Peter. I agree. DT, have you tried GNOME 40? I'm not interested in GNOME. Um, you know, I, I don't care for desktop environments anyway. I'm not going to go try GNOME 40 just to, you know, for myself. Uh, eventually, though, I'll probably review some distributions that will ship with GNOME 40 and, you know, we'll have a look at it on the channel. But just, you know, me playing around with things on my own. Yeah, uh, I, I don't care about GNOME. I don't care about GNOME as a desktop environment. I definitely don't care about the people behind GNOME. They're just bad people. And I want to give them as little coverage as possible. All right, Kelly, DT, have you looked at the Nixt browser? No people have asked me about it, but I haven't taken a look. And uh, Kelly goes on to say it's written in common list. Yeah, it has Vim, Emacs, CUA usage modes. Okay, well, it sounds cool, and people have asked me about it. I just haven't gotten, gotten around to it. it Maybe something I, I get around to soon. Let me open up a page here in my Emacs here off camera. Actually got a little show idea. <laughs> org document that I, I jot things down in occasionally. Hopefully I'll get to that at some point, but uh, don't hold me to that. So We'll see though. I'll write it down though. The next browser. I've got things planned. I've got a couple of things planned here in the next uh, three or four days. I've got I think three video ideas that are already in the works. Um, and I think a couple of them you guys will be interested in. I don't want to spoil things, but <laughs> but uh, we're not reviewing any browsers anytime soon. But if I do check out a new browser, maybe the next one I take a look at will be the Nixt browser. There's another one people keep asking me about, too, that I'll eventually get around to. Uh, can't remember which one that is. It's another one of those minimalist browsers. All right, let's see. Uh, I had a super chat here. I lost uh, Michelle. Uh, she says, cheers for answering the question. I'll follow the advice. The documentation is decent enough. Yeah, I mean, even if you follow my video, open up the Gen 2 wiki and, you know, go line by line with the wiki. And if it comes to a point where the wiki tells you to enter something that's not quite what I'm doing, then go with the wiki because it'll probably be more up to date than my video. But the video is mainly... Not to be a manual to follow. It's mainly, hey, just watch my video. Don't don't even have the Gentoo Wiki open. Watch my video and just watch me the process. I'm gonna go read the wiki, then I'm gonna enter this in a terminal. I'm gonna go read the wiki, then I'm gonna enter this in a terminal. It's mainly to show people that are not used to doing that kind of thing that that's all you need to do. Because a lot of people think this stuff is harder than it is. A lot of people imagine that you have to be a programmer, you have to be a, a sysadmin to even do any of this stuff. And you don't, right? I'm just a, a normal guy. I'm just a normal computer user. I don't work with computers at all. I've never had a job, uh, you know, in IT or anything like that. And like I said, if I can do this stuff, anybody can do it. And Big Pod is in the chat. He says, hello, everyone, and DT. Big Pod, Josh was looking for you earlier. You'll want to catch up with Josh. He's got some things to say to you. DT, <laughs> uh. is there a good tool to manage my Bluetooth mouse? It doesn't work well. I bought it from AliExpress. I don't know anything about uh, managing Bluetooth uh, mice like that. Sorry. My mouse is plugged in. I don't. I don't... I don't even like wireless mouse and keyboards anymore. I, I, I like to have everything plugged in here at my main workstation. And uh, Bluetooth, I really don't play with Bluetooth at all. Except on my phone. <laughs> that's, that's really about it. Yeah, uh, Peter says, Ed Browse. That one is really minimalist. I have never heard of Ed Browse. I should write that one down too. Yeah, DT, I heard you're supposed to call me out for something. Yeah, uh, Josh wanted me to 
tell you something. I don't know. I can't read his chat though. It's already been too long. Too much chat has passed by. I'm sure Josh will remind you here in a minute though, or he'll remind me. Let's see. Muhammad says DT is a normie now. I've been a normie since the beginning. I've never not been a normie. <laughs> Uh, whatever that means. The Linux cast is also in the chat. He says, hey, DT. What's up, dog? <laughs> guys, go check out the Linux cast. Another great YouTube channel you guys should be checking out. Let's see. Hey, DT, do you recommend open DNS or is there an open source alternative? So do you recommend open DNS? I, I haven't played with open DNS. So this is for DNS. Uh, resolution and things like that. I, I know there's supposed to be some advantages to using it, but again, I not in system administrations and you know, I don't do that much with uh like web servers and things. I mean I have my own sites that I you know, play around with, but you know, I don't work in in that sort of field, so I don't really have a comment on that. I bet though because it's such a good question. I bet people in the chat will probably have some recommendations for you as far as if you should use OpenDNS or maybe another alternative. Yeah, so Big Pod says, Josh was watching your stream, so Big Pod was streaming earlier, and he said that he will pay you to call me out about something. I think it's about coffee and me not being a real developer. That's what it was, yeah. Yeah, you nailed it, Big Pod. Well, I'm glad that he said he would pay me to call you out because I thought he would try to send me a few bucks via Super Chat and try to get me to grow my hair out because that's usually what happens on these things. Or I get people messaging me, you know, <laughs> private messages. Hey, how big a Super Chat would I have to send to you to have you grow a mullet? <laughs> or, you know, just weird things like that. You guys have some weird ideas. And you're very fascinated with my hair. Earlier in the chat, by the way, I know somebody asked me about my hair color. It's light brown. Um, I mean, you guys have seen me with facial hair. Of course, on the face, it's a little darker on, on your hair, head, you know, especially as it gets longer. It's a little lighter. It's light brown. Although I haven't grown it out in so many years, there's probably a lot of gray in it now. Let's see, Michelle. Hey, DT. New Debian version is coming around soon. Any interest in reviewing it? I'm always going to take a look at the really big releases. So when Debian comes out with a new version, yeah, I'm always going to take a look at that. When Ubuntu has its big releases, especially the LTS releases, I'm always going to take a look at them. Fedora, I usually take a look at the Fedora releases. I, usually, I don't miss those. Even if I... N don't run any of those. Like I don't run Debian, Ubuntu, or Fedora. I'm gonna take a look at those distributions uh, because they they matter a lot, right? Debian, of course, is huge in the uh, in the server world. I'm always gonna take a look at the latest Debian, Ubuntu LTS. Of course, is probably the most popular Linux distribution on the planet. Although, you know, I was looking for some interesting news items earlier today and you know, Linux related news items maybe to spark some discussion so I went over to Google News and I typed in the word Linux and the third article down is titled MX Linux is the most downloaded Linux distribution and now I know why so this is an opinion piece and the title of it is MX Linux is the most downloaded desktop Linux and now I know why and it's a Tech Republic article. And I'm looking at that title. And I was like, there's no way. Wow, that thunder is really loud. I do apologize, guys. If I lose networking and the stream goes down, it's, like I said, a pretty serious storm. But uh, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is Tech Republic. It's kind of a legit website. I mean, they do tech-related news. And how could anybody think MX Linux is the most downloaded Linux? Uh, and this guy, this uh, uh, journalist here, Jack Wallen, I mean, I've seen this guy around for years writing at Tech Republic and other places. He's not new to Linux, right? 
He knows better. There's no way this guy thinks MX Linux is the most downloaded Linux desktop distribution. And of course, he's quoting DistroWatch. What makes this even funnier is DistroWatch actually does not m measure Linux downloads. But he claims that. <laughs> he says this MX Linux is the most downloaded Linux distribution on DistroWatch. DistroWatch has never, ever measured Linux downloads. And that's not what DistroWatch page hit rankings are. Matter of fact, DistroWatch page hit rankings. This means this is the number of times people visited the MX Linux page on DistroWatch. People didn't download anything. Most of these people that visited that page probably are not running MX Linux. Maybe none of them. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just... Oh, I, I, I was shocked when I... I mean, everybody does like clickbaity kind of articles and things like that that... I don't mind clickbait. That's just part of the game, especially in, in print journalism. You got to have a catchy title to get people interested to read the article. And hopefully, you know, this site, Tech Republic, will make a little ad revenue. But man, that that's not clickbait. That's just flat out wrong. <laughs> like, that's just, I, I'm surprised. And again, the guy that wrote it, I know he knows better. I just don't know. I don't know why he went that direction. Anyway, ran over. Uh, uh, Hello says, we can't hear the thunder. Excellent sound installation. Well, I, I do have a, a dynamic microphone, so it shouldn't pick up any loud noises. The only noise it should ever pick up, it, it shouldn't pick up anything as long as I'm not talking. But when I'm talking, while my voice is going through the microphone, that may be when you, you pick up some extra crud. It would have to be a really loud, like, lightning strike for it to actually actuate the mic on its own without me speaking, though. Let's see. Yeah, Peter says, maybe they have a broken download link, so people need to download it multiple times. <laughs> We're talking about uh, MX. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure people use MX. MX is nowhere near the most popular desktop Linux distribution. I mean, that's just... That's just silly. I mean, we all, all of you guys probably are we're pretty heavily involved in the Linux community. You talk to a lot of people that run Linux, I'm like me. You know, I talk to all of you guys. All you guys run Linux. And, you know, when people ask, hey, what distribution are you running? How many people do you actually come across that are running MX Linux? Right. Now, how many people do you ask that question and they tell you Ubuntu or Mint or Fedora, right? Yeah. Um, MX is definitely not the most popular desktop Linux distribution. We really don't have any good metrics to measure that stuff. DistroWatch is not. DistroWatch doesn't even try to measure that stuff. And the the DistroWatch page hit rankings, they're kind of a joke. Uh, because they don't really measure anything that matters. Page hits on D DistroWatch's site. That doesn't matter at all. Because anybody can game that. I can create DT's OS tomorrow. And with my audience on YouTube, I can tell you guys, hey, here's the DTOS page on DistroWatch. I can link to it in every single video I put out. And I promise you, within a month, I will be the number one distribution on DistroWatch. Nobody, none of you guys are probably even running my distribution. It could be my distribution is broken. It doesn't even work. But as long as I get you guys on that page on DistroWatch.com, I will be the most popular Linux distribution in the world according to some tech journalists. <laughs> so that's how that works. DT, Doom Emacs is really slow compared to Vim. What should I do? If, if your Doom Emacs is slow, well, there's, you know, it's going to depend on a lot of things. So if your Doom Emacs is slow, first of all, how many modules, you know, plugins do you have enabled? Because... That's going to slow things down. I can tell you some of the things that will really slow you down. Uh, let me switch to my, uh, let me open up my Doom Emacs. Give me just a second here. I wasn't planning on doing any, anything on the desktop here today, but you go to your packages.el in Doom Emacs, assuming I can type. I'm not sitting directly in front of my keyboard, so I'm trying to type at an angle here. All right, your packages.el, 
I mean, how many third party packages do you have? You know, if you've added a bunch, maybe try turning some of those off and seeing if some of those were slowing you down unnecessarily. The other one that you really need to pay attention to is your init.el. Now this is the big list of like default modules that are available in Doom Emacs. Most of them are not going to slow you down at all. You'll be fine, but I can just go ahead and tell you anything dealing with spell checking and syntax and things like that will massively slow you down. Now, if you need a IDE, it's just, hey, you, you know, if you're a professional developer and you need, you know, all of this stuff, the syntax and, you know, you need to enable LSP or you need to have a, you know, spell checking, a spell and all of this enabled. Hey, it, it's what you need. You don't care about speed, right? You, you need these things. You need these tools. But if you actually don't need all of this kind of crap <laughs> enabled in Emacs, don't enable it. Really, enable what you need and comment out the things you don't need. So that's the thing I would suggest there. Uh, let me get back to my previous buffer here. Make sure I write and quit that. Because that was that document I had open before we went there. All right. Michelle says, I run Debian, by the way. That's a, uh, a, a good choice. I don't hate that. Uh, I've run Debian stable many times in the past. I like, I mean, I've said this before, before running the YouTube channel, because I need up-to-date software to do what I do uh, most of the time here, I'm always taking a look at new pieces of software, brand new pieces of software. So now I don't run things like Debian stable or Ubuntu LTS you know, uh, but if I didn't do this YouTube channel, I'd probably be on those kinds of distributions rather than a rolling release. Let's see. Peter says, DT is the baldest Linux YouTuber, and now I know why. Hashtag clickbait. I had hair earlier today. I, I shaved today. I had I'd actually let it grow out for three days. I'd actually considered just letting it go for six months just to see what happened. But then I was like, no, people will troll me about it. You guys have gotten used to the baldness, so I've got to keep it up now. You've got to keep up appearances. Yeah, DTOS. That's right, Henry. One day. No, I'm not interested in managing a, a complete distribution. Yeah, Big Pod is uh, uh, explaining to somebody, yeah, there's a crap ton of people running the LTS editions of Ubuntu. Absolutely. Yeah, millions, tens of millions probably. Yeah. There's not tens of millions of people running MX, right? Or Manjaro. Manjaro, I'm sure, has more users than MX, though. Manjaro's actually become pretty popular. Like, you, you do find people in real life running Manjaro. I think what's really helped Manjaro kind of become popular is Linus Tech Tips. <laughs> has mentioned Manjaro a few times. And you have Linus, when he does his videos about Linux, you know, they get, you know, two, three million views every time he, he talks about Linux. So that's millions of people that have never even heard of Linux. You know, he's, he's sitting there playing with Manjaro or whatever they're doing. And then they go grab the ISO for Manjaro. <laughs> see, DT, could you explain sometime why you run LM Session with Window Managers? LM, you're probably asking about LX Session. That is an authentication uh, agent that you need running. So... You know how sometimes you open certain programs and they need elevated privileges. Like you'll open up uh, the most obvious one I know of, Gparted. If I opened up Gparted, it's going to ask me for my root password and administrative password. Uh, some other ones, uh, GUF, uh, GUFW, the uh, firewall, the graphical version of the firewall, un uncomplicated firewall. It needs elevated privileges, of course, to change settings in the firewall. Well, how do these programs? Uh, know that well you have this authentication agent running in the background uh, and you need some kind of session running in the background to to handle that stuff i use lx session you guys you don't have to use that particular one let me go to the arch wiki if i do a search for arch linux call kit because it's a policy kit get into the browser here so look for this page on the Arch Wiki. P-O-L-K-I-T. Policy kit, basically, is what it is. 
and then you need one of these programs installed. And these are the authenticating agents. I choose the second one in the list, LX Session. But if you have one of the other ones already installed because you use a desktop environment that already shipped LXQ Policy Kit or Mate Paul Kit or Paul Kit Dash Gnome or whatever it happens to be, XFCE Paul Kit, use those. If you're doing a minimal installation of Arch or Gentoo or some server distro and you didn't install a full desktop environment of any kind, then you get to choose exactly which Paul Kit to install. And for me, I just always choose LX Session. That's just the one I've always used. The reason is because, you know, way back in the day, especially, uh, I, I ne I've never done full desktop environments, but one of the first window managers I ever installed and used and lived in was OpenBox. OpenBox is the window manager that the old LXDE desktop environment used. So I chose the uh, LX session program, which was the session for the LXDE desktop environment. And I've just stuck with it for, you know, forever. But again, you can choose any of the other ones, but why do you need it? You, you'll need it uh, for, for a few things on your programs that need elevated privileges. For example, like your auto start programs, I've noticed in my window managers, like a lot of the programs that need to be sitting in the sys tray on auto start or programs I want to auto start, like the, I have the library app, I think that auto starts and MailSpring, my email client I've been using recently, auto start. None of that stuff's going to auto start if I don't have LX session running. That's just the way that, that works. Let's see. Yeah, there's tens of millions of users on Ubuntu mainline for LTS releases. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's just talking about the desktop. If we're talking about Ubuntu LTS server, then I mean, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of, of servers. Who knows how many millions of <laughs> Ubuntu servers are out there. I doubt anybody could even guesstimate at that number, especially with servers, because there's so many servers out there that never see an update. You know, they're not ever really connecting to the Ubuntu repositories. A lot of people have set up a server and never updated at all for years. Let's see, what good Haskell resources do you know about or recommend? So there is a standard Haskell book that everybody reads at first called Learn You a Haskell for Great Good. I believe is the name of it. Let me do a search for it. Yeah, Learn You a Haskell for Great Good. So pick up that book. They have a PDF. You can also go to learnyouahaskell.com. And that will cover the basics of Haskell. And that's a good place to start. I've read that book, I don't know, two or three times over 10 years. <laughs> that's not something I read. Like it's when I decide, hey, I, I need to get back into Haskell or, you know, I haven't played with Xmonad, you know, in a long time or whatever. Because I first tried Xmonad like 10, 12 years ago. And that's when I read that book for the first time. I, come, I came across that book. Read it just enough so I could configure my X monad my window manager a little bit but then i hopped to other window managers i moved to awesome and open box and qtile i'm on some of these for years and then i come back to X monad and it's been a long time since i read this book and then i read it again so i can get back into my X monad config and actually understand a little bit about what's going on so yeah that's one you definitely want the haskell community is a pretty fervent community there's a lot of people that are really excited about Haskell, the language. So you will find uh, there, there's a Haskell IRC chat that's that people hang out in. Thousands of people hang out in all the time. There's I'm sure there's Haskell subreddits. You go to Stack Overflow, I'm sure you can ask a Haskell question and find plenty of people that will answer your questions on Stack Overflow. So it shouldn't be too hard to, to get some help with any questions you have about Haskell. Let's see, hello is saying, DT, who's the guy on your shirt? Actually, uh, because the camera angle is only showing the top part of my shirt, there's three guys. It's uh, Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. And at the bottom, it's got in text, it says, I listen to dead people. Yes, I'm a nerd.
Let's see. DT, how ripped are you under that shirt? <laughs> uh, that's a weird question. Hello. I, I've, I've got some muscle. I work out a lot. Got some fat too, though. Got to try to get rid of some of the fat. This isn't helping, though. But for a 44-year-old man, I look pretty good when I, when I dress up, when I put on a nice-fitting, you know, button-up shirt. I do okay. Let's see. Clepus. DT, what is the best BSD distro in your opinion? All right, Clepus. Well, first of all, don't call BSD distros distros because... They don't all run the same kernel. Like when you say Linux distro, that's okay because all Linux distros run the same Linux kernel. They may have different modules, you know, proprietary blobs enabled in the thing, but it's basically all the same kernel. The various BSDs, there's really especially three main BSDs and they don't all run the same kernel. They have their own kernels. So you got the free BSD crowd, and various distributions based on FreeBSD. So you can say a FreeBS dis FreeBSD distro, but you can't just say a BSD distro. Because NetBSD is going to run a different kernel. OpenBSD is going to run a different kernel, right? And those are kind of the three main families, uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD. As far as what's my, uh, what's the best, I don't know. The BSD operating systems are mainly for server use. You don't find too many people trying to live in, in them as far as just a normal desktop user. Unless they're really into development or mainly developing for BSD. Because it's not, it's not nearly as mature of an operating system as Linux. Not for desktop use going to have a lot of problems with hardware support and things like that because those kernels are not like the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel's got a bajillion people working on it and you know billions of dollars in backing from Google and Facebook and you know all of this other stuff. So I wouldn't try to run BSD on your desktop unless you have a, a real reason to. Now, if you just want to play with it on an extra machine, go for it. But if you think that it's going to somehow be better than Linux, <laughs> uh, well, you're, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. Let's see. When Fedora 34 drops, are you actually going to give it a fair review? I think I've always given Fedora fair reviews. I've actually had pretty good luck running Fedora, you know, when I... When I run it, I, I don't, I've never run it for that long, but I have run it at various times, even over the course of doing this channel. I've actually made videos before where I was actually running Fedora on my main production machine. Of course, nobody ever knows what distro I'm running on my main production machine because sometimes I hop and don't tell you guys. But I know I've, I've had Fedora running before and made these kinds of videos running Fedora on my machines. So... Fedora's always been good as far as, like, I can get everything working right away. I can get OBS and Caden Live and, you know, all the multimedia stuff. All that stuff's available in Fedora, and it's just easy to get. I usually have less problems in Fedora getting some of that stuff to work than even Ubuntu sometimes, and some of the more recent versions of Ubuntu. Let's see. Uh, yeah, thanks for the BSD info. Well... I'm glad I could help you there. Now, uh, compare IRC and Matrix. They're not even remotely the same thing, so there's nothing to compare. IRC is just plain text. Uh, Matrix is more like Discord. There there you go. That's the comparison. I saved you from having to watch a video. You then saved me from having to make that video. Let's see. Uh, DT, have you ever considered a career in tech? I No, I really haven't. I, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but no, it's not something I've ever wanted to do or was interested in doing. Hey, DT, have you ever done game development? No, <laughs> I've already said I'm not a programmer or a developer. Yeah, game development is something I, I don't game either. So, yeah, like really the last thing I would probably ever do is yeah, game development. 
I say I don't game. You did. You guys got to watch me play a little zero AD the other night. I've gotten pretty good at zero AD, if I do say so myself. I, I tend to win these days, where I used to lose all the time when I played before. Let's see. Uh, hello, DT. What's your favorite container solution? Docker, LXC. Uh, I, I don't play with any of that stuff. Again, desktop Linux user, <laughs> right? Not that you can't play with that stuff on the desktop, but that's not what. That's not where people typically use those things. DT, are you still on free node these days? Nope. <laughs> I don't use IR. I mean, I, I don't hang out in those chat rooms. I'm not interested. I've got too much other stuff going on on my computer to be worrying about people messaging me and things. I haven't been on IRC in oh, it, probably a year and a half, two years. I don't know. It's been a long time. I can't be on those kinds of chat platforms or have a chat window up all the time. One thing, I got too many people that watch my stuff and try to interact with me all the time. I'd never get anything done. But even if, if I didn't do this channel, like just having that kind of stuff up all the time, that's never been the kind of person I am. It's, it's distracting. And I find, uh, I don't know. I find uh, I'm one of those people that I, I get laser focused on something. Like I sit down and I've decided I got to get this done today and I'm going to do it. And I get started and nothing can distract me, right? I can't answer a phone. I can't have a chat window up. I can't have people knocking at the door, ringing the doorbell. Like I'm, uh, I can't even have the TV on. Right? <laughs> I'm one of those kinds of people. So yeah, it's, those are just distractions that I, I just don't like having. Let's see. Yeah, Clepus, I loved your April Fool's video. Yeah, I cracked up when you clicked Windows 10S. And that wasn't even an April Fool's video. So I typically don't do April Fool's video. I did one, I think, one time, Windows Tube, where I changed the uh, name of the channel from DistroTube to Windows Tube. And I did a like a Windows News video. And even that video, even though it was kind of funny, it was like legit stories about Windows. But the uh the one you're talking about where I reviewed Windows 10 for the very first time, you know, kind of like my distro reviews, because I don't, I haven't used Windows in like 12, 13 years or whatever. So I'm going to review Windows 10 for the very first time. It makes sense because I, it's a review channel, right? <laughs> and people were like, man, I know you were joking when you clicked Windows 10 S. It was the first option. That wasn't a joke. I mean, why wouldn't you click the first option in the list? I don't know what the hell Windows 10 S is. They didn't even explain it in their inst installer. So, oh. kind of like the distro reviews. When I do a first impression look at a distro, I never know what I'm going to see for the first time. And I know people get mad. Well, you should have known this was like this and this was like that. Well, no, I come at it brand new, first impression. Same thing I did with Windows 10. Uh, Microsoft should explain to people what the hell. <laughs> Windows 10 S is because they didn't tell me not in that installation. And I was looking in that installer trying to figure out which one I should choose. So that even though I posted that like April 1st, you know, two, three years ago, that was not an April Fool's video. That was a legit video. <laughs> uh. DT, if you had your own Linux distro, what would you call it? DTOS. Uh, Michelle, the other day I tried to sideload free BSD on a throwaway laptop, and it took three hours just to get WLAN, uh, your LAN up and running. Yeah. You see, that's the thing because of the kernels. You know, it's not like the Linux kernel where it's just going to handle all your hardware and everything's, you know, your networking is just going to work. You know, if you were using Wi Fi, Wi Fi is just going to work. That's, that's not necessarily going to be the case with the BSDs, though. So. Really, if you if you don't have a reason to use BSD, like at a job, you know, if you deal with BSD servers, you really don't need to be using BSD on your desktop or your laptop. Again, unless you just are doing it for fun, you don't mind torturing yourself and it's an extra machine. Hey, I, I get that. I play with all kinds of operating systems all the time on my test laptops. But some people... Uh, they, they think there is like this magical elite land they'll get to where, you know what, Linux is too normy. I have to go to something 
uh, less normy, you know, something more elite, <laughs> something more a more based operating system, and FreeBSD is going to be that operating system, and people are going to think I'm just a super hacker and I'm so cool because I run FreeBSD. Well, good luck. I tell you what, if you get Wi-Fi working on that laptop, maybe you can communicate to us and let us know. But chances are nobody will ever know that you installed FreeBSD because that laptop ain't going to work. Yeah, I put GhostBSD on my main production machine that one time. As you guys, we did a poll. Hey, what operating system, you know, what distribution should I put on my main production machine? And I had recently done a review of GhostBSD, you know, on the channel. You guys wanted to see me run GhostBSD on my main production machine. I didn't make a video for four days straight. Because I didn't have working audio on my computer for four days straight. And eventually I had to go back to Linux. It never had a working microphone. It never picked up. It had a problem picking up anything that plugged into any of the USB ports. It was just, it was bad. And I spent days researching the problems, going through forums, the GhostBSD forums and the FreeBSD forums and trying different things out. And, and every now and then I'd fix little problems, but the big one that I never could figure out, I never had a working microphone, ever. Without a working microphone, how could I, how could I ever use that? So, I had to admit defeat on that one. Yeah, Big Pod says, I'm still so sad Windows didn't win on that one. Yeah, I forgot. Windows 10 was a choice. I said I was going to run something for, what, 30 days? And being that I've never really run Windows, you know, not Windows 10, anyway, no, none of the real modern uh, versions of Windows, that would have been an experience. It wouldn't have been the worst thing because it, it, it would be educational for me to actually learn a little more about Windows. The problem with the Windows uh, votes in that poll, uh, we had somebody trying to stack the votes for Windows, so I kind of disqualified Windows from that poll. We had a father-son duo create a bot. <laughs> I guess they wrote a bot to uh, continually vote Windows up in the poll. Which is rather cool. I, I'm glad this father and son got together and got to do this nerdy project where they were going to try to stack the ballot against me. But I was like, yeah, but I can't really. It's, it's no longer a legit poll <laughs> if I know all these votes for Windows 10 are fake votes. Let's see. DT, of the three musicians on your shirt, who was the best? Uh, it depends. Who was the best? At what? If you're talking about who was the best as a musician or as a composer. So the three people on the shirt are Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. If you're talking about uh, legit musical talent as a performer, Mozart would probably be the most talented of that bunch. Although Bach and Beethoven were very talented musicians as well. But Mozart was really quite a child prodigy as far as, you know, his performances, especially, you know, on the, uh, the piano, the keyboard. Though Bach was very proficient at the organ, well known for his performances. As far as a composer, Bach was definitely, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's uh, tough because all three are just gigantic figures in music history. You talk about the history of music, like the, the, the three, three guys here, all were giants. Everything you guys are listening to right now, pop music, metal, and everything, you, know, you owe a lot to some of the stuff these guys did back in the day, but Bach was the better composer as far as just the overall quality of the music he put out. He put out a massive catalog of music. Bach wrote so much music that even music historians to this day still don't know how this man wrote so much music. Like there's just volumes and volumes, just books and books of all of his music. You go to a, like a music library. And it has been said from some historians that if... You had to copy Bach's music by hand today. And of course, he had to do all this by hand. This was 
centuries before computers. If you had to copy box music by hand, one guy estimated it would take somebody 70 years to do that. <laughs> so how the hell did he write all of that in his lifetime? It's just crazy. And it's very consistent as far as the quality of that music. Bach wrote some just fantastic stuff. Yeah, Mozart and Bach were medieval metalheads. Well, they weren't medieval. That's a different time period. They, these guys were a little, little later than the medieval period. Medieval music wasn't nearly as developed. Uh, speaking of music, can you a musical instrument? I'm assuming you're asking, can I play a musical instrument? Or you would you like to learn to play any? I play several. I actually have two degrees in music, Michelle. I've actually played musical instruments several times on the channel before. Sometimes in live streams. Let's see. Bach had a ghostwriter. I mean, he must have. People are still amazed at that that volume of music that he wrote. Oddly enough, not no one really knew about Bach as a composer during his lifetime. He wasn't well known. It wasn't until decades after his death that people, well, really somebody just kind of stumbled across his music and was like, wow, what is all of this? <laughs> yeah, Beethoven also didn't write his last two symphonies, probably. He was deaf. Well, he had started losing his hearing uh, way before yeah, the last couple of symphonies. Uh, him not being able to hear, he, he could still write music. Because, uh, it's not like you have to hear it to write it. He doesn't, you know, he didn't have people performing the music so he could hear it and then write it. You know, it's not like today where you've got this feedback where if you're at a keyboard that's plugged into your computer and you're, you know, playing on the keyboard and the music's happening. You can hear it and it's being written to the sheet music, if you will, on your screen. No, that's not what they did you know, before this kind of technology. He heard it in his head. He knew exactly what he was putting down on paper and he could hear it in his head. So even after he lost his hearing, he still knew what he was writing. Uh, hey DT, why is UX term seen as trash? It's the fastest and has an acceptable amount of features I don't know what you're talking about as far as UX term being seen as trash I, I, I don't know <laughs> I've never heard anybody I've never heard anybody mention UX term really so why nobody nobody's out there trying to debate that it's trash or not I mean very few people use UX term but really all of the X terms Whichever one you want to use, they're all fine terminal emulators. Well, you know, once you have a working config, I've used Xterm as my main terminal emulator for a long time at different points in my Linux history. So, uh, Peter says, "Why did you never learn to play the piano or guitar? I can play the piano a little bit. I don't, I don't own one at this time. I wish I did." Uh, but I'm I can play the piano a little bit. I mean, if you give me some piano sheet music and you know something that's not crazy difficult, yeah, I, I can get around on the piano a little bit. Why didn't I ever learn the guitar? I just never learned it. I never bought a guitar. I'm one of those people that when I decide to learn something, I'll go buy the instrument and I'll make myself learn it. You know, like a few months back, I had this. I don't, all of a sudden urge. You know what? I was listening to a piece of music. It had the harmonica in it. Like, you know what? I'd like to learn the harmonica. So I bought a couple. I bought two harmonicas. <laughs> you know, in different keys. Just because I, I wanted to learn how to play the harmonica. Let's see. I know I've missed some of the chat here. Let's see. Yeah, Mozart wrote the Requiem and his last symphony without a single... Correction in the manuscript on his deathbed when he was terminally ill. Yeah. And these guys, you know, because they spent years writing this music the what that way without needing to actually 
be at a keyboard and play it while they write it or, you know, having a, a string quartet or a symphony, you know, play it back as they write it, you know, trying out different things. You know, these guys just got used to, they knew what it sounded like in their head. They didn't, but they didn't need to put in a whole lot of trial and, and error. I, I know Bach was like that. That's why he was able to write so much music. You know, he could write these really complicated pieces of music, all of these, especially things like all of his fugues, which are kind of complicated. And, uh, yeah, he, he just, he, he knew what they were going to sound like when he was, as he was writing it. Harmonica, did you mean the accordion? No, I meant the harmonica. The harmonica, Big Pod. Come on now. Let's see. That's for you, Richard. <laughs> uh, one of these days, we need to get Richard on the show. I'd like to do a duet with Richard. Me and Richard singing the free software song in real life this time. Not that pre-recorded mess I did a couple of years back. Is he going to play the harmonica for us? I don't know that many tunes, to be honest. I mean, I can play a few things. I, like I said, I just got this not too long ago. It's not like I sit around and, and play these instruments for hours and hours every day. I've got, you know, my recorders and the trombone and everything else. But Let's see. Yeah, that was a little uh, Aaron Copeland. DT, did you listen to a lot of dead people? <laughs> What's your uh, hardware audio setup? Well, obviously, with all the classical music I listen to, yeah, most of those people are no longer with us, but even a lot of the popular music I listen to, <laughs> you know, I listen to a lot of stuff from the 70s and 80s, especially. Many of those people are no longer with us. Yeah, simple gifts. That's that's right, Mitchell. That's an old uh, shaker hymn. The shakers were uh, it's a religious sect here in the U.S. And that was one of their hymns. It's called Simple Gifts, and Aaron Copeland used it uh, near the end of his Appalachian Spring, which is a wonderful piece of music. Hey, DT, what are your opinions on Gentoo? Have you, have you ever tried bass Gentoo? Sure. I've installed Gentoo a couple of times, playing around with it. I've, I've played around with a lot of Gentoo bass distributions, too. It, it's fine. Um, I don't like sourced bass distributions as far as running on, on my main production machine. I've got so much stuff to do on my machine that it's just time-consuming, just having things compile all the time. It's... I can't do that and do what I do. But you guys, if you're interested in <laughs> compiling everything from source, go ahead. Try Gen 2. And there's many other distributions that do that as well. DD, what are your thoughts on Lenart Pottering, creator of Pulse Audio and System D? Um, he still needs to fix Pulse Audio. <laughs> That's my thoughts on that. <laughs> Lenart, if you're listening, Pulse Audio's a mess. DT, where do you host your Gemini capsule? So I have, I actually have web hosting with three or four different companies. And the company I'm using for my Gemini capsule is a company called SkySilk. They just do these really cheap uh, VPSs. 
Oh, you can get one for like $3 a month or, I don't know, $5 a month. And like the really basic package, you know, bare bones package is fine for something like a Gemini capsule. Let me open my terminal and... So this is Gemini colon slash slash distro dot tube. And I've been working on that a little bit here lately. I, I made a video about that oh, a while back too. And of course you guys, I mentioned that I was going to, basically this will be my main website. Everything I do, I'm going to write to this Gemini capsule. And then I've got a script that I run and it converts the Gemini capsule to HTML for me. And this is the HTML. That's actually running in the Brave browser. And now that is located at distrotube.com. HTTPS colon slash slash distrotube.com. Now I could put them on the same domain. I could actually have a Gemini server and a web server both running and using the same domain. So you could go to Gemini distrotube.com or HTTP distrotube.com and you would get, you know, the, whichever site loads depending on the protocol that you were trying to use but i'm keeping them as separate domain names as well right now uh, distrotube.com i believe is also hosted on sky silk distrotoot.com my mastodon instance is hosted on digital ocean i've also got some web hosting over at uh one and one.com although i think they have they changed their name recently um, uh, I know that's typically where I register my domain names. I, I've been using them for ever, uh, 15, 20 years. I've used a lot of different, uh, a lot of the big web hosting companies that people have heard of. I've probably have used at one time or another. DT, thoughts on where Pipewire will take Linux audio? I have no idea. I haven't played with Pipewire yet. We'll see. I have the perfect harmonica amplifier. Keep practicing and I'll send it for free. All right. Let's see. DT, well, that we, I got confused since my language we call accordion or harmonica. Yeah. Hey DT, it's possible to generate HTML and Gemini markup from an org document. I'm aware of that. Don't give away spoilers though. There may be a video on that soon. Maybe. DT, would you rather use GNOME or Windows 10? Now, that's a tough choice. I can get tiling window managers on Windows, right? I'm pretty sure I can. Although I have used GNOME, and I, I hacked GNOME in such a way I basically was using it like a tiling window manager, I could probably get by with either. Let's see, yeah, and Big Pod, uh, Peter to Big Pod in English, it is harmonica too, I think, that, that DT said it wrong. No, this is the harmonica. And the accordion, is, typically people call it an accordion in English. Now, these instruments do have different names. Like, even though most people would see this and call it a harmonica in English, some people would call it a mouth organ. Some people will call it a blues harp. But most people are going to call it a harmonica. Let's see. Pipewire broke Spice and Vert Manager. You, uh, so you didn't have sounds in your virtual machines, I'm assuming? Yeah. Yeah, I can see how that could be a problem. Let's see. Arch switched to Pipewire and it broke my audio setup. I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's life on a rolling release distribution right there, though. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, I get the complaint. I feel you. But at the same time, uh, so, like we run these rolling release distributions. That's going to happen. It's like I've had many things go wrong with an update 
on Arch-based systems. I mean, nothing that permanently broke anything. Uh, I could fix it, but... I mean, that's kind of what you sign up for when you run a rolling release. Let's see. Sorry for the repost. Are there any resources to make a backed... I'm assuming backend, maybe? Backend for a Gemini capsule. I'm trying to do it for a coding project. I know it might be bloat, but just asking. I don't know of any. But because Gemini is so simple, like everything you want with Gemini, as far as like you wanted to create, you know, some really simple, like a content management system or something that just kind of deployed a site automatically for you, you know, a little simple scripting. You can do some simple shell scripting or some simple Python scripting. I, like Gemini's perfect for, for that kind of stuff. It was made for that kind of stuff. Hey DT, what would happen to Linux if Adobe gave their software native support on Linux? I think people would use a lot of those products. I personally wouldn't use those products, but I know a lot of people would. It, it still shocks me that Adobe hasn't um, released Linux ports for their software. I think a lot of people would love to run Photoshop and Premiere Pro on Linux. Just because of all the overhead of running heavier operating systems like Windows and Mac, you know, Linux tends to be lightweight. Like if people really wanted a workstation that was mainly for editing video, Linux is perfect for that. If we had a good video editor. <laughs> uh, unfortunately for Adobe, even if they did release Premiere Pro on Linux, you know, Lightworks has been on Linux forever. So there's already professional level video editors available on Linux. You got Lightworks and you do have a uh, DaVinci Resolve as well now. Uh, thanks for the super chat. That was from Kazi. Uh, he didn't leave a question or a comment, but I do appreciate the super chat, sir. Thank you. Now, I've never had anything go wrong after an update on Arch or Gen 2. Give it time. Give it time. <laughs> you will. Because uh -huh. sometimes they have to break things. You know, sometimes, like if there's a major update to something, like moving away from Python 2 to Python 3, for example, just give you an example of one that happened to everybody that was running Arch based systems not too long ago. All your Arch, or all your uh, programs that needed Python 2. They're not going to work without Python 2 <laughs> installed on the system. So. Uh. And so sometimes you get major updates to these programming languages that break all the apps that use those program those programming languages. And the solution is, well, you got to go reinstall all those programs, have them compile again, compile against the right version of that programming language. So, yeah, I, I get you. You've never had anything break. Well then you've probably been on Arch or Gen 2 for like a month or two. Give it time. It'll happen. It, it won't be anything that you're going to have to reinstall for, probably. Hopefully not. It'll be things you can fix within a few minutes. And usually you go to like like the Arch front page. They'll tell you, hey, this update's coming out. It's going to break this. Here's what you need to do to fix it. So, And I think a lot of people, when they have these breakages, they don't go and actually check out like the news on the Arch Linux page. If they just check the front page for Arch Linux, usually they'll tell you, hey, this is about to drop. It's going to break this. Here's how you fix it. Uh, thanks for the super chat there, Alex. It says, hey, DT, from Shaved Head Bro. Okay. How do you manage your time to be so performant? I'm not sure what you're asking. How do I manage my time? You're asking about, like, just work schedule and how to get things done in a timely fashion. I, I mentioned this earlier in this stream. I don't when, typically when I set a, aside a block of time to do something, I do it and I try to limit distractions. These days, I think a lot of people are, you know, we live in this new world where 
ADHD is <laughs> the norm, the attention deficit disorder, and, and people will get are just flooded with all this input. Everybody's always got their phone next to them. It's blowing up with notifications and people, if I, I've got m all my monitors here, you've got a Discord chat window open. you got Netflix playing on a monitor over here. Maybe you got something else playing on a TV over here against this wall and yeah, turn all that crap off. <laughs> right? A lot of people also ask me about notes and note-taking, note-taking applications. I don't really do much of that, although I've been getting more and more into it since moving to Emacs. I've been playing a lot more with org mode because I like org mode. And org mode makes it really easy to keep notes and keep an agenda, keep a calendar, appointment book, if you will. Though for the most part... I, I've never used that stuff, and I, I don't think I need it. I, I think a lot of times, a lot of people, once they really get obsessed with note-taking applications and appointment books and calendars, they spend more time on that stuff than they actually do on the work they need to get done, if that makes sense. Like some people get way too obsessed with their calendars and appointments and agendas. Let's see, installing Xmonad through Stack finally gave me some stability with it. Yeah, I, I've been satisfied with Xmonad through the standard Arch repositories. Now, I've installed Xmonad with Cabal. I've installed it with Stack before. They work. But honestly, just the standard Xmonad packages, the stand, standard Haskell packages from the Arch repositories have worked for me. Worked for me for a long time. Uh, let's see, Michelle's got another super chat here. Haskell updates on a daily basis and it never broke on me. What gives? Yeah, but most of those Haskell updates are really small little modules. So that's it, very, very minor updates, even though it's a lot of packages that update. They're, they're very minor updates. It's not like a major version upgrade that's happening on a daily basis. So it's a little bit uh, deceiving. You think more is going on with those updates than, than there are. Yeah, you shouldn't really ever have any uh, Haskell updates that break things on you. Hey, DT, if you couldn't use anything Arch-based, which distro would you use? Debian Stable, Debian Unstable, Ubuntu LTS. I'd start with those probably. I've run all of those before, <laughs> so I, I'm saying you, if you're asking me for your, you, yes, maybe try some of those. But for me, I want something as minimal out of the box as possible, because I'm not, not going to use a desktop environment. Like everything that ships with most of these desktop distributions, I don't want anyway. I want to build it from the ground up. That's why I'm you know, like Arch or a lot of the Arch-based distributions, they make that a little easier. Gen 2 and the Gen 2-based distros would be fine. Of course, you gotta, you got to deal with the compiling with some of those Slackware. It's the same kind of thing, although it's older packages and Slackware. And again, you got to deal with compiling. I do like NixOS and Geeks. I like, I like those kinds of distributions. These uh, um, immutable distributions. I kind of think that's the future. You're going to see a lot more distributions like that in the future. Because they're just really neat. You write a config file for the entire distribution, basically. For your entire operating system. And it can't break on you. Because if it ever breaks on you, you just roll back to the previous version of your operating system, essentially. It's just really neat. I would use Geeks if it wasn't one of the Linux Libre, you know, one of the 100% free distributions. It just won't work on my equipment. I would use Nix. Nix will work on my equipment because it uses the standard Linux kernel. I have no problems running Nix OS on my main production machine and getting work done. The problem with Nix is some of the stuff that I like to use on a daily basis are not packaged for Nix. 
some of the window managers I like to use all the time, like every day, are not packaged. So, uh, all right, I, I need to catch up on some super chats here. Give me just a second, guys. Uh, Han says, "Stay curious. Your channel is a nice, casual way to be introduced to new software. Appreciate that, Hans." I got some new software to introduce to you guys here. I've got a, a couple of videos planned for the weekend. I think I'm going to release videos both Saturday and Sunday, you know, depending on life and depending on how long these videos take to make. But I've got one really interesting program I think I'm going to talk about tomorrow. I think you guys are going to really be interested in. Yeah, Peter, just shout out for Rat Poison. <laughs> you guys and Rat Poison. Uh. Maybe one day I'll take a look at Rat Poison. Actually, I think I've got it installed on my system. I just haven't actually done anything with it. I think I installed it. I just haven't logged into it. or I still log into StumpWM on occasion just to make sure I really hate it. and I, 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 It's still bad. I logged into it like three or four days ago. I was like, yeah, I don't like it. Let's get back to Xmonad or Qtile or something else. A Chaos Fang says, take my money. I had to give a little bit for the abundance of information and entertainment. Thank you, sir. And Swayam Shri. I know I mispronounced that name. I do apologize. Tell us a bit about your life outside of YouTube. Well, right now, there's not much going on outside of life and uh, what I do on YouTube. So this is my job, essentially, right now. And other than that, you guys know I go to the gym, you know, most days of the week. I usually go to the gym for about an hour and a half to two hours, you know, four or five days a week. And that's about it. <laughs> music, you guys know about my music. Though I did get that question earlier. Yes, I, because people will often ask about education and jobs and things like that. So my degrees, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in music performance. That's what I went to school for. That's what I trained to be, a professional musician, classical musician. So, yeah, not into computers and programming. I didn't go to school for any of that stuff. As far as uh, sometimes people ask me, like, books and music and things like that favorite uh, music as far as a genre classical music obviously but i also like classic rock i like oh, rock from the 70s and the 80s even the 60s i like the oldies too like oldies country sometimes sometimes i can get into that uh, metal even i don't mind a little metal every now and then Books, I really don't read much these days. I used to read a lot when I was younger, but these days, mainly just for time. TV, I don't have a TV. I haven't had a TV in years, so I don't keep up with like the latest shows that go on on TV. I do have a Netflix account. Log in every now and then and watch something on Netflix, watch a movie. Let's see. No tucks, no bucks. What's that? Oh, that's somebody's nickname. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Let's see, DT, what is harder, rocket science or music theory? Uh, I will say m uh, m people end up flunking out of first year music theory. Uh, like 80, 90% of the people that take it. You guys probably heard that. That was very close, that lightning strike. Well, my freshman year of college, we started with 65 people in music theory, first year music theory. Second year music theory, we started with 12. Of those 65 that started in first year music theory, when I graduated, two other people graduated with me. So, a problem is a lot of people get into music thinking that well they're going to go get degrees in music and they really don't understand what they're signing up for they don't understand there's a lot more to it than what some people think i wasn't one of the, like i knew what i was getting i had already t taken some music theory even in high school read books and you know but some people really 
they sing all the time. They sing in church, right? They sing in their church choir, and they really don't know, I'll go to college and I'll get a music degree. But they have no idea what they're really going to college for (laughs) as far as what that music degree even entails. So then they get into first-year music theory, and uh, some of these people can't even read music, much less really get into you know some of the theory behind it and some of the physics behind it. There's a lot. If you really mentally, if you're not good with science and math, you're not going to be good at music, not music theory anyway. But I would say you're not going to be good at playing music either. You got to have kind of that mathematical kind of mindset. Just joined. Have you made music? If so, can you show us? If you're asking, have I ever written music? Yes. Can I show you? No, I don't have anything easy to get to. So most of the stuff I wrote to was stuff I wrote by hand, you know, 30 something years ago, even in college, some of that stuff. We had computers you know, in the, the mid 1990s. All of that stuff was done on the old Macintosh computers, not modern Macintoshes, you know, not Mac OS 10, right? I'm talking about the old Mac OS. I don't know anything about modern Macs or modern Windows machines. So a lot of the stuff I wrote on those, I can't actually open them in any kind of like music writing programs or anything. On (laughs) This is not going to run on any of the operating systems that I would have available to me anyway. Now if I had them printed out, and I do have stuff printed out, but nothing handy. That's not, I haven't written anything in a long time. Although people have asked me about Linux programs that you could use to write cheap music and there are some and I played around with them a little bit there was one that I really liked because it it produced just beautiful sheet music as far as just the print quality I believe it was called Lily Garden was it or Lily Pond I think it's called Lily Pond that was a really good program and that was and I played around with that I don't know 8 10 years ago that was a long time when I looked at that way before doing the YouTube channel Hey DT, why don't you play on your channel recording using free software? Because the channel's really not about music. And I, I like I'm not set up for that. I don't like well, I mentioned I don't have a job in IT or system administration. I also don't don't have a job, you know, in music. <laughs> I don't make a living doing music. It's not something I've done in years, so like it. I don't make a living doing uh, music composition. If I did, then I'd have a you know keyboard here, and I'd have a setup where I could actually do things. So I, I don't have any of that. Don't even know where to begin with that stuff because I've never needed to do that. I could do that, but then I would only be doing it just to do it <laughs> on camera. And yeah, Lily Pond is great. Yeah, Lily Pond. I, I remember that program. It was really cool. Yeah, Dennis Hallman says, greetings from the deep south. How you doing, Dennis? Good to see you, sir. At DT, I watch a guy called Caseback Watches, and he finishes his videos playing Gypsy Jazz, which he specializes in. <laughs> Makes an enjoyable outro for two to three minutes. Yeah. Well, I'll play the free software song on the outro, on the harmonica, since it's the only instrument I have handy. I, I could go grab a recorder, I guess, but... You guys have heard enough recorder on these. Let's see. I don't know. Let's just come up with something. Ooh. Hello from Ohio, says Merle. How you doing, Merle? All right, guys. Well, we've been streaming for oh about an hour and 20 minutes. You guys got anything else you want to ask? Get it in now. Let's see. One of the things I, I was going to talk about a little bit well, was what is going on with library and the uh, SEC, the lawsuit that's going on with them. I don't exactly know how that's going to play out. I don't expect, I wouldn't expect the library guys to win that particular lawsuit. So I'm kind of worried about them. 
Also, I did want to mention those of you that have a bunch of LBCs laying around. Might be a good time to cash those in for something else. Oh, convert them to Bitcoin or Ethereum or US dollars. So, one of the things that is going to cause me a lot of problems is, you know, my, my job for the last year has been strictly making videos. You know, making these videos on YouTube and on Library and Odyssey. And a large percentage of my income has been from Library and Odyssey. You know, I do well over there. For those of you, I mean, I've got one of the bigger channels on the entire platform. And, you know, I, I've always been able to get by financially. I'd probably get by financially even without it. But it's been a big help. Like it's a substantial chunk of my income it's from LBCs over on Odyssey. And soon, we might be losing that. So Now, one of the interesting things is because the SEC is suing library, is a lot of the crypto exchanges here in the U.S. are dropping LBC. They want nothing to do with it because they don't want to get into legal problems. So uh, one of the biggest exchanges here in the U.S. is Bittrex. It's a global exchange, but specifically for U.S. customers, a week from today, next Friday on the 16th, they are delisting LBC from their platform. So no longer, do you, if I want to go do a currency exchange, LBC is not something I can exchange anymore. So what I've been doing is I have already gotten all my LBC off of off the platform and I'm going to try to get everything I have off the platform by Friday of next week. And then everything I get after that, I don't know. I mean, I, I may just have a whole bunch of LBC that gets stockpiled on Odyssey for a while because I'm going to have to find an exchange that I can use as a U.S. customer that doesn't mind letting me exchange LBCs. That may be a hard thing to find for a little while. So, I mean, you guys, you I want you guys, I want more people following me on Odyssey. It's free and open source software. If you guys want to tip me some LBCs, that's great. Even if I go months or even years <laughs> without it being able to actually convert that money into something I can actually use, that's fine too. You guys don't worry about that. But for those of you that it is a concern, if you, especially you guys, if you guys actually are content creators on Odyssey, you guys might want to be thinking about some of this stuff too. Especially if you have large amounts of LBC just hanging out on Odyssey. Might not be a good idea, right? You might want to move that LBC off that platform. And honestly, once you move it off that platform, you might want to convert that LBC to something else. Because you definitely don't want to be, you know, you don't want everything to come crashing down and you be one of those people that was left holding the bag. And, you know, you don't be one of those people. Let's see. Mm, looking for some questions here. Yeah, DT, uh, Big Pod says, DT, my biggest income is also library. It's slightly bigger than zero. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mainly because I don't make money making videos. Yeah. That's another thing about library and Odyssey is you don't have channel requirements like you do on YouTube where you have to have a certain size channel to even be part of the monetization program. You don't have to on library. They don't care. It could be your very first video and you can start getting tipped LBCs on your very first video. Uh, one of the, the real pluses to Odyssey. Well, the SEC might not be in the wrong about the whole library thing. Well, I mean, right, wrong. I, I, I'm not going to, Talk about it in terms of morals, but if term in terms of a legal matter, yeah, I don't expect them to win. Even if they had a good case legally, the SEC, I mean, they go after billion dollar corporations all the time. They typically win. And the library guys, I mean, they don't have money. They don't have money to fight something like this. I mean, they're not gonna they're gonna go to court, but they're not gonna win. I I, I would I would suspect they won't. I, I hope they do. I hope they win. Because it would be a really big deal for, obviously, library, but I think the crypto industry as a whole. 
but I'm not expecting it. I'm preparing for the worst. Now, what is this going to mean for Odyssey if a library loses the lawsuit? I don't. I think the site will probably stay up. Even I mean, even if the library guys go broke and they can't afford to keep the site up, uh, the community, especially since we have all this LBC, especially well, many of us are going to have LBC. We can't even do anything with. I think we could uh, use some of that LBC to keep the site up and going. I think Odyssey, the platform, will be fine. I think the currency, though, I think the value of the currency is going to go way down, especially if they lose that case. I think it's going to crash the price, which really sucks. I've got 100,000 LBC on a USB stick that the library guys sent me you know, over a year ago as one of the founders of the library. I was one of the early adopters. You know, I was on the platform I was just a few months after it really started. That 100,000 LBC was worth nothing when they sent it to me. If I was able to convert that now, that 100,000 LBC is probably like $20,000 US. And I may never get that. I may never even may never even be able to use that now. We'll see. All right. All right, I think that was about all I wanted to talk about. Talked about a little bit about what I was doing with Jim and I, about the library situation. Thought oh, maybe we'd bring up the uh, free software stuff just very briefly because people have asked me. I haven't talked about it. You know, I made the video about it when it was fresh. And as far as, you know, my thoughts on it now, it's still the same, I think. Uh, having given it a week or two, you know, just to absorb what's going on within the Free Software Foundation itself, I think it's been a good thing for the Free Software Foundation. I suspect that they've been flooded with a lot of new membership now. <laughs> because I see a lot of people saying they've joined the Free Software Foundation in support of, you know, the Free Software Foundation reinstating Richard. So, financially, it's probably been a a good thing for them. So that is good for those guys. For Michelle here, her super chat says, shout out for the day. It was fun chatting with you all. Good night. Thank you, Michelle. And I agree. This was a fun stream. I'm going to go ahead and kill the stream here in another minute or two. So last call. You got to get it in in the next 30 seconds. So it's recorded for YouTube and Odyssey history. Assuming this gets synced to Odyssey, we'll have to see. Let's see. DT, if you post a GitHub issue on the Nix packages repo, they'll package it within a few days. They get stuff packaged pretty quickly. That's good to know. Might be something I do then. All right. Uh, dating or marriage tips. Are you asking me for dating or marriage tips? I've got nothing on that. I'm a Linux user. Enough said. All right. Uh, Dennis says, sorry, I got to go. Thanks, DT. Yeah, I'm out too, Dennis. Thanks for, for hanging out, sir. And if you couldn't convert back to national currencies, it'd be worthless. Yeah. My LBCs, though, I'm just going to convert them to U.S. dollars while I can. I, I would be okay converting them to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's pretty standard these days. Bitcoin's not going anywhere. The price fluctuates wildly, but I'm not going to wake up one day and all of my Bitcoin disappear. I don't think that's going to happen. DT, will you be taking a break from videos due to what you discussed? Oh, no. No, I mean, I won't be... Uh, it, it won't affect me that bad. If I take a break from doing videos, it's because I'm going to take a vacation. It's got... It won't be a financial <laughs> decision. Uh, and I, it may not even really affect me financially. There's going to be some weirdness here in the next week or two because the exchange that I was using is going to shut down. Well, they're not shutting down, but they're delisting LBCs. It's going to be difficult for me to get some of my money going forward. I'll probably be able to find an exchange that will work for me. 
I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to see. It. Here in the U.S., though, a lot of exchanges that do business in the U.S. are scared to touch LBC right now. But I, I bet I'll find one crooked exchange, you know, one really shady exchange that I have no business having my money <laughs> tied up in. I bet I'll find one of those that I can at least do something with. Yeah, thanks, DT. Really enjoyed the evening. Set me up for an awesome weekend. Have a great one. I appreciate that. Well, let me get out of here, guys. This lightning is, you know, really loud. You guys probably heard that la last thunderclap there. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, before I go, let me thank the patrons of the channel. I want to thank each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to show you some names on the screen here. These are my patrons over on Patreon because, of course, these guys help support my work. They help support what I do. And without those guys, I couldn't do what I do. Oh, I clicked on that scene too quickly. I meant to say peace. Now back to that scene. That's so unprofessional. <laughs>